Welcome back guys. I am stoked to say the E30 is officially done. We've got our S52 swapped in, our manual transmission is in, the whole thing's up and running. We've got H&R coilovers underneath it. We've got beautiful three-piece Alpinas on it. We've done the interior. But on to top, this is like the coolest daily driver I think I could put together. It's quintessentially me, and it's an awesome tribute to my late friend, Corey. Now, if you want some backstory on why I'm doing this project, you should check out the playlist I've got on the channel. It's some of my most meaningful content I've ever produced. But if you're just here for the action, I've got good news. We're gonna knock out the entire rest of this build in just two episodes. Today, we're gonna get this thing up and running. So let's knock out a full engine and transmission swap in one episode. Let's go. We're gonna start with a steering rack because it's a lot easier to get all these parts situated without an engine in the way. As for why, E30s can benefit tremendously by swapping out the original rack for a number of alternatives that offer a much quicker steering ratio. In our case, we're using an E46 ZHP rack for a nice medium balance between ratio and stability. Swapping racks is a bolt-in affair, and to make it work, we're gonna utilize this Condor Speed Shop steering shaft to link it to the original E30 steering column. Our reman steering rack showed up with mashed up splines and I had to straighten them out by hand, but otherwise it's a pretty straightforward installation. After indexing the parts and making sure I have them all where I want them to be, it all comes back apart for some work on the drill press. These parts strongly resemble the steering components on the Model A, and as some of you guys might remember, those came apart on me in a spectacular fashion, so I'm taking every precaution this time around to make sure that's impossible. Along with deep indents, Loctite, and lock washers on all of the parts, the length of the D-shaft itself means it can't come out without removing the steering rack. Considering the fact that the engine holds the steering rack captive, this thing isn't going anywhere. As part of our massive parts collection sent over by our friends at FCP Euro, it's probably pretty expected that we're gonna put things like a new fuel filter in this car. But what I wasn't expecting was to get carried away with the details. Using the parts cleaner from our friends next door at Lightbow, I cleaned up the original CAD plated mount, and then I'm pairing that with all new hose clamps and new hoses. The intent of this project was never really to be a restoration, but as you guys have seen in the last episode, and you'll see through this one, that kind of becomes a common theme. This is just a daily driver, but I want it to be the best daily driver I can put together without blowing the budget. But if we're gonna get carried away, we might as well install an all new AC system from AC Solutions. And while we're at it, we'll tuck a pusher fan in front of the AC condenser. Now AC Solutions sells a complete R134A conversion kit for 24 valve swapped E30s. All of the parts are bolt-on, so you don't have to cut them up like I'm doing here, but given that I want to mount the fan to the condenser itself, I'm making some slight modifications so it all tucks into place nicely. I'm not a professional at much of anything, but I do know my way around BMW cooling systems, and I've always said nothing beats a mechanical clutched fan. But fitting one on a 24-valve swapped E30 is a challenge. You have to use some specialty parts we don't get here in America, and so I'm opting for a 16 inch pusher fan in front of the entire cooling stack. I know firsthand this will do a great job of keeping everything cool and with a few additional holes added to the AC Solutions brackets, it will bolt right into place with only millimeters to spare. With all of the hard to reach goodies in front of the engine installed, we can turn our attention to the rest of the AC system because our AC solutions kit comes with an all new dryer as well as all new lines and the compressor that attaches to the engine. Most of these parts aren't entirely necessary and we could have scabbed together an AC system that worked with the parts that we had. But one thing I've decided as I've gotten older is that I'm putting the importance of air conditioning over pretty much everything, even functioning brakes. I'm not going anywhere if that AC isn't blowing ice cold, and now we should have just that. Before the engine goes in, there are a few other parts and pieces that will be easier to install now 
rather than later, most of it revolving around the firewall and our manual conversion. We had to install a new pedal box so we'd have a clutch pedal, and with it we need to install clutch hydraulics and a new throttle cable for the S52. This involves putting some new holes in the firewall, and I want to use factory grommets so we don't have water intrusion. That does bring us to the engine mounts now. My friends at Condor Speed Shop make these awesome UHMW engine mounts specifically for M50 and S50 swaps into these cars. Some might consider them to be a little bit harsh for a daily driver, but if we pair them with rubber transmission mounts, they should be just fine. There are a few last minute parts and pieces that need to go on the engine, like a new AC belt tensioner, but with that, we're ready to take it off of the engine stand and hang it over the car for the very first time. While it's possible to drop an engine in solo, I was lucky to have Khalil and longtime friend Sam Dobbins stop by to lend a hand lowering it into place. If I haven't clarified in the past, the M50 and S50 platform is more or less just a twin cam version of the M20 inline six that came in these cars. So while you do have to figure out a few things in terms of fitment, like using a 944 brake booster, the rest of the swap is straightforward. It bolts right in. At least it's supposed to. Given that we're using an assortment of random parts, such as our custom oil pan and our aftermarket engine mounts, not everything wants to play together. We're running the oil pan into the steering rack, and while I realized I did space it in the wrong direction, dropping it all the way down didn't help as much as I needed it to. So I had to make some custom spacers to get everything to line up and get the oil pan to clear the rack without much interference. Once I felt good about the clearance, it was time to take the chain off the motor and call the engine installed. Along with our engine mounts and our steering shaft, the guys over at Condor Speed Shop have made a ton of other parts that we're also going to use for this swap. We've got a heap of suspension bushings, we've got brake lines, clutch lines, our transmission mount, and most importantly, our engine swap harness. Condor allows you to tell them exactly what year your car is, what model it is, and what engine you're swapping in, and a few days later, on your doorstep will be an engine harness that simply plugs in and works. It takes all of the guesswork out of the swap, and while I will say that anybody willing to learn a little bit of basic wiring info can wire this swap themselves, there's definitely no better way to do it. Especially if you're going to swap in an OBD2 engine and keep it OBD2, which we'll touch upon later in the episode. And speaking of later in this episode, or in future episodes, if you haven't subscribed yet, you should. It doesn't cost anything, and it's an awesome way to support this channel and allows me to keep making episodes just like this one. Plus, you don't want to miss the next one because this car is actually already done, and I think you guys are probably going to be stoked to see it rip. My BMW guys out there know that the cooling system is the most critical part of keeping this car alive, and thankfully, our friend Ravi at CSF has brought by one of their E30 24-valve swap radiators. It's significantly bigger than the original radiator, and it doesn't have annoying things like plastic end tanks. It's all aluminum construction, and thicker core means it'll have more than enough cooling capacity to keep this motor cool. We'll mount it up using all new OEM radiator hoses that we got from FCP Euro, plus or minus a couple of modifications we'll need to make it work in the E30 chassis. And just like the AC, heat's pretty important too, so let's hook up the heater core so we've got a full functioning HVAC system. Now, as mentioned, things got a little bit carried away as I undertook this engine swap. And so along with the all new cooling system, I decided I'd put an all new power steering system in the car as well. I bought a brand new reservoir and all new hoses, 
and I'm pairing that with a brand new power steering pump on the engine so that everything, including the rack itself, is brand new. Necessary? No. But I just can't help myself. Guilty of hopping around from job to job as I work on projects like this, so now we're going to lift the car up and go underneath so we can set up our clutch and flywheel. We're using a Fidanza lightweight flywheel that we got from our friends at FCP Euro as well as an OEM Sax clutch. Our manual transmission of choice is the Getrag 260. It's the factory 5-speed that comes in a manual E30. We could pair our engine with the 5-speed out of an E36. And that comes with a few notable differences, namely the angle that the transmission sits at and the gear ratios inside of it. Our choice of transmission means that the transmission will sit at around a 10 degree angle compared to where it should. It will be leaned over ever so slightly. So we'll have to modify our shifter mount to accommodate for it, which isn't too big of a deal. In the name of getting carried away, I stuck our transmission in Liked Valve's parts washer and tried to get it looking as close to new as I could. I brought it back over, continued the degreasing process, and then fitted it with a bunch of new parts, like new bushings, new detents, a new clutch fork, and a new throwout bearing, just to name a few. All of these parts together will make this transmission feel incredible from the driver's seat. By updating the shifter mount style and pairing it with an E36 M3 shift lever, we'll have what is essentially a short shift kit that feels solid in aftermarket while using all factory parts. With that, the manual conversion is done. Now we need an exhaust. And one thing we can't really do is scab together a bunch of factory parts. So I reached out to Magnaflow to find out if they had any sort of solution for this thing. And unsurprisingly, they don't have an E30 kit. But what they do have is a kit for an E46 330i. And if you're blind and deaf, those are pretty close to the same thing. I told them I might have to cut it up a bit, but I figured I can probably make this system work and save myself a ton of effort instead of custom fabricating something from the headers back. So the question is, how well will an exhaust system from a late 2000s car fit on something from 1984 with an engine swap? Realistically, this shouldn't work, but my theory is that the platforms for these cars remain largely unchanged across multiple decades. While some factors might not quite work, maybe with a bit of modification, it'll get pretty close, and pretty close is all we need. And as the ancient proverbs say, if the steering rack fits, so will the exhaust. Connecting it to the header. It's pretty, pretty not bad. For an exhaust, it's not meant to be on this car. E46 Magnaflow system. 90% of the way there, pretty, pretty sick. I'm surprised. I thought this would be way too long and totally different path. And this just shows the continuity between three series from mid eighties all the way up to mid two thousands. Cut that off. No. Oh. Should probably have that. Well, this looks really good. Looks really good here. You couldn't really ask for much more clearance here. It's just the dip there that could go up some. But you can just drive it and find out if it's bad. So yeah. If you look here, the only problem that we've got is just a little bit of touching here, and then we'll clearance that, move some stuff around, join it to our Schmiedman headers, and have an exhaust done. And so much to my surprise, this system is pretty close to fitting. The only thing that I really think is necessary is to get the middle muffler or resonator to move backwards around five inches. By moving it back, it clears some of the shapes molded into the floor and gives us a lot more clearance to the ground. 
From the resonator forwards, I think we're gonna have to redo, but for now, let's focus on the back half. Lucky for us, Magnaflow put a pair of slip joints exactly where we need them to be on a straight section of tubing. By simply cutting five inches off the end of this part of the exhaust, we can slide it back together, and I think at least half of this exhaust can be considered done. Of course, we could just slam this thing together with rough cut edges, but I don't have it in me to do that. We'll clean everything up and try to get it as close to factory, so to speak, as we can. Now about that front half. We've got a mate from the headers to this middle resonator, and unfortunately the pipes that are on here aren't very close to fitting, and with our aftermarket headers, we need a different solution. I kept trying to remind myself that this is supposed to be a quick and dirty daily driver project, but once again, I got carried away. This time, we're gonna hand build some TIG welded pipes that will go from the headers to the center section of the exhaust. I wanna route them in such a way that'll give me a lot of ground clearance and good flow characteristics. I can't say that it's necessarily important for power because we're not making a ton, but I don't have it in me to do this job dirty. In fact, we're not gonna bother with any cheater cuts and we're gonna do this the right way, bottom to top. We'll keep the pipes parallel where we can so that they look presentable and we'll merge the sizing successfully from the header to the midsection. So I'm gonna cut this one here and get rid of some of this kind of grabbing from the mandrel bender on it. I'm kind of making multiple pieces and parts work here. We're kind of scabbing something together. So the back half of this, as said, is um, E46 system. And then we just kind of have to bridge the front to the headers that we have, which are for an E36, so they don't really clear the floor. I'm probably putting in more effort than I should, but I wanna kind of know that it was done at least somewhat right. But we've got some original pieces from the Magnaflow system that we've cut up, and then I bought some U-bends down the street because I'm in a rush. And yeah, they're not like exactly the same size, so hopefully once we weld it up, it'll look okay. But if not, uh, it'll be our secret, I don't know. And by not exactly the same size, we're only talking about a millimeter or so. Not even the thickness of our welding rod, so I'm not worried about impeding the flow or having any negative effects. And thankfully, once welded up, it's completely impossible to tell, so I'd call that a success. I decided to cut the factory E36 style flanges off the bottom of the headers and convert everything to V-band while I was at it. This felt like the best solution for the sake of simplicity. So let's get it all welded together. So, when we've welded stuff on camera before, some of you guys have noted that I do what's called back purging. I fill stainless steel parts like exhausts with the welder, welding gas, argon in this case. And the reason for that is when you see stainless exhausts and stuff or anything welded that's stainless and you see all those pretty colors in there, color is technically a form of oxidation. And if you don't have any shielding gas, it'll go like dark, dark gray, almost black. That's no good. And technically speaking, even colors like blues and those kind of pretty rosy colors, those aren't ideal either. You want an even straw color in a perfect world, but that can be hard to do. Overall though, the problem is, is if you don't displace the oxygen inside of the part, oxygen is what causes your oxidation. If you don't displace the oxygen inside the part, it's gonna oxidize on the inside. So we're gonna fill the entire part with argon, and then we're gonna use our big cup that we've got here to displace oxygen on the outside of the part and try to keep any oxidation from happening so we have a nice, clean, strong weld. Some out there are gonna suggest that back purging this exhaust is overkill, but my response is that if you're not back purging your stainless, you're half-assing it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. As far as the colors of stainless welding go, I'm with you when I say, I think those blues and purples, golds, and reds look amazing. But also in a perfect world, you want that even gold color, 
because that means there's less oxidation and less of a chance for corrosion. But given this is an exhaust, none of that really matters. And I just hope that someday I've got the kind of weld control to get whatever color I desire anytime I want. With the tube work done, now it's down to the details. We need a few mounts, namely to support the muffler and the exhaust midsection. I want to try to use the original E30 style rubber support so the whole system has some give and isn't making the car rattle. So I'm just attaching a strap to the muffler exactly like the original exhaust had. I'll do the exact same thing under the center section and attach it to some original threaded mounts in the floor. Finally, we're going to need to fix that exhaust tip. Sorry Magnaflow, I like it, but it's a little bit too new school for a car as old as this. Call me a simpleton, but I've always been a fan of a classic, tried and true, straight cut piece of tubing, nicely finished on the end, and hand polished with a piece of scotch braid. This is of course the final step, because we need the exhaust installed so we can get the length of the tip correct. With the tip done, we can install the exhaust for the last time and cross it off the list as well. The only downside is we forgot to shoot some finished footage, so you'll have to deal with it. While the Condor swap harness took care of all of the hard work, we still have a little bit of leg work to do in order to call the wiring finished. After modifying the original hole in the firewall, we can pass the new E36 DME plug through and then mount the computer inside of the car away from the elements where it will be safe. There are a number of factory and aftermarket brackets that will allow you to mount the E36 DME in the factory location, and that's the kind of detail stuff that I really like when it comes to this sort of job. For wiring, most of what we need to take care of at this point is just power and ground wires. Most of the E36 stuff just transfers over to the E30 chassis, but we'll cut and shorten the power wires so we can effectively hook them up to the power post that's in the engine bay. This is essentially just a power distribution block that's connected directly to the battery in the trunk. This should give everything that we need to supply 12 volts to 12 volts, and with a few other odds and ends taken care of, we can consider the wiring portion of this done as well. But I'm not one to just want to leave the E36 harness sitting on top of the engine. E30 M3s come with plastic wire cladding that mounts to the firewall, and I've heard that if you're careful, you can cram all of the E36 wiring inside of it and create a nice flush finished look. And they weren't lying when they said you really gotta cram it in there. It was a couple hours of modifying, adjusting, and making small changes before everything clipped closed, but the end result is a nice, clean, sleek look. With belts installed, we are finally nearing the finish line. I want to wire in the fan now as opposed to later because truth be told, I know as soon as this thing runs, I'm going to want to drive it, and the second we stop in traffic, it's going to do its best to overheat. I want to wire the fan into the original BMW wiring, and after checking to make sure that it's blowing in the correct direction, We'll wire it in to a late model coolant temp switch in the radiator so that it'll automatically trigger the fan on and off as it's needed. We'll heat shrink all of our connections and then apply heat shrink over the entirety of the gap. And with that, we've mated the original fan plug onto our aftermarket fan. We'll tuck the wires out of the way where they can't get hit by anything drop the radiator back into place, and then connect our coolant hoses and get this thing filled up with coolant. It's a small detail, but I've opted to use factory BMW hose clamps on every connection. One, because I want it to look the part, and two, because compared to any aftermarket alternative, I've yet to find anything that works quite as well. So another thanks to the boys next door at Lightbow for letting me raid the entirety of their hose clamp collection so I can get this job done. And now for the tricky part. I know how to wire a car, and I've done it in its entirety many times over. But what I don't know how to do is program a car or write to its computer. So you guys are going to join me on a first-time adventure 
as I do my best to flash the factory MS-41 S-52 ECU so it'll play nicely with our engine swap. To do that, we're gonna need to add an OBD2 port to the car. So what I'm hoping to accomplish at the moment is the engine came out of an OBD2 car. The E30 is obviously pre-OBD. And in order to make this whole swap work, we need to flash the ECU. We have to get rid of things like EWS, which is like an immobilizer safety system, anti-theft. We need to get rid of like secondary O2 sensors and just some other random crap we don't need on this car. But to do that, we need an OBD2 port and the car doesn't have one. And I'm not positive that this is gonna work, but I have done a little bit of reading and I don't know, connecting some dots here. And this harness does have a diagnostic port on it. And I think if I do some jumpering and build kind of like this custom harness type deal and then use another cable with a different plug on it, I can flash the ECU from the computer with the ECU in the car and get rid of those things. So fingers crossed. I think it's pretty sound logic, and my buddies Sam and Andy have both said they too think it'll work, so I'm gonna give it a shot. I found that if I flipped DTM pins backwards and crimped them onto the wires, they'd fit perfectly into the prongs of the factory BMW X20 connector, and thus should give me the opportunity to build a bridge from the old connector to a new OBD2 port. Following some online diagrams, I'm able to pin things where I think they need to go, and to test whether or not this is going to work, we should be able to hook it up to a standard OBD2 reader and test some basic functions. If it sees the computer and sees its sensors, I think we're going to be in business. Let's see what it has for codes. Read codes. Solenoid valve running losses control circuit electrical. Don't know what that is. Don't care. Throttle pedal position sensor switch. Don't know what that is either. Don't care. It's only two codes in there. So let's, uh, let's plug in with the laptop and see if we can actually flash this computer. I'm gonna use this little jumper that I made here, uh, which should put the ECU into write mode. Uh, and allow us to reprogram it. And I've never done this before, so I'm a little scared. But thankfully, there's some easy to use software out there. I'm using MS41 Quick Flash to read and write from the ECU, and then open MS41 so I can actually access ECU settings. Again, a thank you to both Andy and Sam for giving me a walkthrough on this stuff because I'd have no idea what I was doing without them but I'm happy to report back this stuff was way easier than I anticipated it to be. With this software, I can turn anything on or off and make all sorts of tuning adjustments to the stock ECU, including fuel mapping if we ever wanted to do things like modify the engine or do something like turbo it. Not that I plan on going there, but it's cool to know that it's possible. Everything successfully wrote to the factory computer, so we can cross tuning off the list as well. And now all we need to do is focus on getting all of the little things of this project out of the way so we can start this car for the very first time. Last but not least, but perhaps most importantly, we need to put some oil in the car before we start it. As always, we'll be going with Pennzoil Platinum Full Synthetic, and specifically their 5W30 weight, as it's exactly what BMW spec'd for these engines back in the 90s. Seeing as we're going into our Californian winter, it's the perfect weight and viscosity for what we're doing here. But while we're adding Pennzoil to the car, we're also going to add some to the shop. It's long overdue, but we've finally got a sponsor banner to hang up over the fabrication bay, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of the Pennzoil family that it's about time I make them a permanent fixture in the shop. But with oil in the car, all that's left is to finally try firing it up for the very first time. Here goes nothing. I know at this point it's wishful thinking to assume the car will ever start the first time you try to give it a go. 
But thankfully, since we've worked hard to retain OBD2 functionality, we can actually look inside the computer and have it tell us what it thinks is wrong. We can look at the codes that it throws and diagnose from there. Initially, we realized we had a few sensors unhooked from when we actually dropped the engine into place. But from there, things got a little bit more complicated. We had spark, but no fuel. We also had no codes to work with. Everything seemed happy, and the car would run on starter fluid, but we couldn't do much else to make it run for any meaningful amount of time. Honestly, I was stumped. If I were an injector, why would I not fire? I'm plugged in. I mean, anything that's, tr as far as I know, anything that triggers the spark, which we know the spark is working, would also be triggering the fuel injectors. So maybe something stupid like a ground, that could be. But it was not a ground. In fact, it was a lot sillier than that. I had forgotten to install the factory remote fuel pressure regulator because I had assumed it was on the rail like every other BMW. But with it installed, we had fuel pressure and the thing would finally fire up. That feels like a good stopping point. Next episode, we've got suspension to go on this thing. We've got wheels, we've got some interior work to do. And then we're gonna go take this thing out and we're actually gonna beat on it. It has been a ton of fun to drive over the past couple of weeks as I get it broken in and get it feeling good, get it dialed. I'm so stoked on this thing. I hope you guys are enjoying this content. Again, subscribe if you haven't. It helps me out a ton. And I'll see you guys next week where we finish this project up and I've got the engine out of the Ferrari. We gotta check that out too. I'll see you guys then. Thanks as always for the support.